fasting uh, when you're heavy is never fun, as they say, right? You, you, you notice that there may be a little bit slower brain functionality and so on and so forth. So what I thought we would do every Tuesday is read actually the last part of a poem that's written by a teacher who uh, I'm familiar with, um, a great Egyptian scholar, one of the great Egyptian scholars from the end of kind of the medieval period, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Ad-Dardir. Um, Sheikh Ahmed Ad-Dardir was a, a phenomenal um, scholar, um, jurist, uh, theologian, uh, you name it, and, and really, um, wrote on a number of topics. I used to actually study in his old mosque, which is in front of his house in Cairo, in the old part of Cairo, uh, with one of my teachers, Sheikh Ahmad Taharayan, uh, who recently died of COVID-19. But anyways, this poem is called The Glimmering Pearl, uh, al Kharida Al-Bahiya. And the reason it's called A Glimmering Pearl, it's like, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where you can't see things like the depth of the sea, then Islam is like this pearl that shines for you, right? Like Islam and what it has to offer is, is a shining, shining light. And the last part of this poem, I think is extremely timely for the month of Ramadan. And it's great for everybody because the last part of this poem is talking about how can someone have a meaningful relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do, we, how do we move into, say, a situation where we feel, and this has been my experience, is that I see Muslims tend to fall into like one or like, like probably four categories. The first is the person who has maybe struggled in life and they have like this trepidation, right? Like, I got to give up something. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm not sure I'm good enough for this. That's the first kind of person. That was like me before I embraced Islam, you know, at the time I was reading about Islam and studying about Islam. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this, man. Like, I don't know if I can give up some of the things that Islam is asking me to give up. And my assumption was wrong. And that takes us to the second person is a person who thinks like to become a person who lives a life of faith means that like, I have to give up everything, right? All at once. I just have to go cold, tur cold Turkey. And that also is extremely frightening and intimidating because it doesn't come without sacrifice whereas islam says you know step by step take things step by step um the third person is someone who is somewhat religiously inclined but still not sure they want to take the step and then the, the the last is someone who may be actually religiously inclined but may even be deceived by their religiosity like i i i'm good you know what i mean like i need to work on myself so all of these are, are somewhat answered by our religion in that there's always a balance and a beautiful nuance answer to this. For the first two people, there's this idea of hope and taking faith as a process. For the third person, the one that's worried about like, you know, am I good enough for this? Usually that's like a really sincere, good person. We tell them that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you to the month of Ramadan, so you should trust that more than you feel insecure of your own sins and evil. Right. If you weren't invited to the party, you wouldn't be at the party, man. You know, like you wouldn't have got in. And then for the last person, we tell them you should fear Allah because subhanAllah, we, we are always going to be in need of improving ourselves and making ourselves better. So this poem, Alhamdulillah, is going to go through certain practical things that we can do to work on what our scholars called a sayru ir Allah is the path to Allah, the journey to Allah. And defining that is very simple. One of our teachers said that the path to Allah is the constant journey where I am going against my nafs and going against my desires in favor of submitting to Allah's command. And that's a process. It doesn't happen suddenly. And it, it needs certain furnishings around it sometimes to be facilitated. And one of them is the reminder and learning. So the sheikh, he says, and, and it's important to note that this book actually is written, it's about theology. I teach it at my school, Swiss, um, in the third or fourth year. The, the, the majority of the text actually is a poem on theology. And the reason that he starts with theology before tasawwuf or taskiyat to nafs is if I were to tell you, if I were to say to you, hey, 
go find this person. And I didn't tell you what the person looked like. I didn't tell you anything about them. I just said, go find this person. There's this person I'm looking for, go find them. You wouldn't be able to find them. That would be impossible. So then how is it in this dunya that someone would expect to be able to be on the path to Allah if they don't know who is Allah? How could they find what they don't know? So that's why we start with theology first. And then is fiqh. And fiqh is, of course, how to worship, the art of devotion. And then the cherry on the ice cream is how do we create our capacity to work on our inner character and our outer character? So subhanAllah, the, the, the relationship between theology, devotion, and to soul becomes very clear from this example I gave you. Go and find somebody, and I don't tell you what the, who they are, what they look like. I don't tell you anything about them. It would be impossible. You'd be lost. But if I were to give you a good description of that individual, you would be able to find them. So subhanAllah, the shaykh, before he starts to talk about traversing the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about knowing Allah. So that way, if I find myself searching, I know what I'm looking for. I know what I'm looking for. So he says, and I think you're really going to like this text because it touches on a lot of practical things we can do because there also are times like when we feel like this is like impossible. You know what I mean? Like how to do this. So Sheikh Ahmed Ad-Dardir in this small poem as we're going to read it every Tuesday night together at NYU, and also it's now on Instagram Live, talks about what are the practical things we can do as we take the journey to Allah. Unfortunately, I don't think this, this text is available on Amazon, but I have translated it, and I'll get it to you guys. Although it's the Oklahoma Rewaya. So that translation is not necessarily the, you know what I mean? It's not necessarily the peer-reviewed perfect ruaya but i have it and i will send it to you all inshallah so he says after talking about all of the major beliefs of islam and our connections to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says he says that everything that i just talked about everything belief in god belief in angels belief in the prophets belief in the day of judgment belief in the hereafter all of that is encapsulated in Kilmat al-Islam. And Kilmat al-Islam is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So it's like he's saying every, everything that I talked about until this point is found in this beautiful statement, the statement of Islam. What is the statement of Islam? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. This is extremely profound because if we think about how he's now mentioning like all of Islam is found in this statement because sometimes things feel overwhelming and some things feel like really difficult. And one time a man, he came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he said, in the shara'i al-islam yaqad kathurat. He said like, it's too much now, man. I became Muslim early on. Now it's just too much. You know, I became Muslim in Mecca and now in Medina. It's just too much to do. So is there something you could show me that I can do that will make up for this? And the Prophet wasallam said to him, keep your speech busy with the remembrance of Allah. That's why Imam al-Bukhari in his large compilation of hadith, the, the last hadith is a beautiful hadith that says two words, two statements that are light on the tongue, heavy on the scale, and beloved to the most merciful. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al -Azim. As if to say like everything that is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, this nine volume work, right? You can make up for some of the shortcomings by making dhikr, by remembering Allah. And we believe that remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is restorative and resuscitative. 
Because usually, as Imam Al-Ghazali talks about, usually people fall into sin because they think about sinning first and they remember sin first. Recently, a brother contacted me. We converted together, man, in the early 90s. It's one of the, one of the OGs. And he was telling me that he was having some difficulties. And I said, what? what's going on? And he started to tell me, man, I started thinking about like this, started thinking about that, started thinking like, what if we never did this? And what if we had done this? So I said to him, see, like, this is the remembrance of sin. This is the, the vicar of evil. It's going to lead to evil outcomes. It's going to lead to evil outcomes. So, subhanAllah, the, the, the brother was like, yeah, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm engaged in dhikr in a way which is, like, unacceptable. I'm thinking about something wrong. Imam Ghazali said, sin starts with ideas. So, if I replace the remembrance of things with the remembrance of Allah or the remembrance of things which are good, I'm going to immediately start to shift my internal composition. And I'm going to start to replace bad thoughts that are followed by bad actions with good thoughts. The second beautiful thing about remembering Allah is that everybody can do it, mashallah. Right? You don't have to be, I don't have to be some kind of super successful Muslim. I don't have to be a super religious person. I could just be that person that's just trying to get it right. And one of the most beautiful things is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why that man, when he said to the Prophet, Ali, he said, to salam, like, I, I can't do all this. And the Prophet said, then make dhikr. Make dhikr. So the Sheikh, he says, mashallah, um, he says, وَيَنْطَوِي فِي كِلْمَةِ الْإِسْلَامِ He says that encapsulated in لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مَا قَضَى مِنْ سَائِرِ الْأَحْكَامِ That لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ is Islam. And that takes us now to the first quality that we want to think about on the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُوا لَنَا those, those who strive towards us, we will guide them. And striving is different for different people. For some people, striving is leaving sin. For some, some people, striving is, is praying all your tarawih because you've already got it going on, mashallah. For some people, striving may just, you know, just I'm just barely holding it down. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everybody's condition. So out of his mercy, what may be sinful for a religious person may be subhanAllah jannah for the sinner. Because the sinner, that's their battle. That's their struggle. So the sheikh, he says something beautiful. And this is the first quality that we want to work on as we go into the month of Ramadan and out of the month of Ramadan. He says, Rahimahullah, فَأَكْثِرَ مِنْ ذِكْرِهَا بِالْأَدَبِ تَرْقَى بِهَذَا ذِكْرِ أَعْلَى رُتَبِ Allahu Akbar. He says, فَأَكْثِرَ مِنْ ذِكْرِهَا The first quality that we want to acquire in the month of Ramadan is to say, La ilaha illallah abundantly. فَأَكْثِرَ From kathir. فَأَكْثِرَ مِنْ ذِكْرِهَا Say as much as you can, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. There's no God except Allah. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in an authentic hadith, أَفْضَرُ مَا قُلْتُ أَنَا وَالنَّبِيُّونَ مِنْ بَعْدِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the best thing I or any of the Prophets said is La ilaha illallah. So the Shaykh, he says, start here. Like this is where you want to get down. And oftentimes people make a mistake. They try to do too much in the beginning, so they set their self up for failure at the ending. Like I was talking to some people, like, what are your goals for Ramadan? Yo, it was like solve, solve nuclear fission, you know what I'm saying? Get a new COVID vaccine that works for everybody, pray all the time. Like, dude, just pray, bro. Oh no, no, that's too easy. You call that brother Taya Fajr. Akhi, did you pray? Ah, uh, no, I'm still trying to solve nuclear fission. What what see? So we we try to go for things that are out of our circle of influence instead of being balanced and responsible and that sets us up for failure or we get too laxed right there should be 
a little, you know, uncomfortability, but not to the point that it breaks me. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to order us to do only what we could handle and we got angry about it. He used to order us what we could do. And we wanted to do more. We, we could do more, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet said, no, 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 no. Take it easy. Take it easy. And our beloved messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said that the best person is the one who does, or the best deed is the one that's done consistently, walaw aqal, even if it's a little. So what happens, so happens, is people set these really, really impossible goals for themselves. It's like when people, you know, go to the gym. They set these really impossible goals for themselves. And then when they fail, they give up completely. And that's what happens in Ramadan. Oh, man, today I didn't read, my, I didn't read you know, 25 juz of Quran. My Ramadan's done. It's the first day, man. It's the first day. So instead... And that's why I like to talk to imams. I say, you guys are like tech support for people, right? Be there to help mold and shape people so they come to a balance. Not too harsh, not too relaxed, but do something that you know you can do consistently. That's very important. Absolutely. You can ask any question, Adam. Don't worry. Feel free to jump in. People can ask any questions, inshallah. So the dean of moderation. Yes, sir. My quick question, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. My quick question is basically, uh, how about if you have been doing something consistently and then you feel like, okay, maybe I can move on and do something, you know, new, but then you keep telling yourself, okay, if I don't keep up with it, keep up with it, then I'll upset Allah by not keeping up with something new. Well, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not petty. Right? Allah is not petty. And, and Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, يرى, whoever does an atom of good will see it. So just because you started it and maybe you had to step back for a minute does not necessarily mean that Allah subhanahu wa is going to be angry with you. Allah subhanahu wa is kareem, ra'uf, rahim. And any effort, it's a journey. As we're going to talk about in a minute, this is a process. Sometimes we're going to go fast. Sometimes we're going to go slow. Sometimes we may stumble. Sometimes we may fall. It's a process. So there's nothing wrong with that. You, you, want to, you want to test the waters a little bit, right? You want to see, and you don't want to get bored with the same worship that you do for, for an extended period of time. So it's good to switch things up. So the, mashallah, there's nothing wrong with that, especially when you couple that with like a great intention. Your intention is like, I'm just trying to build. And sometimes when we build, we have to step back for a second. Take a break, go back to building again. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a really great question. And someone needs to tell this person the rule for saying sorry if you ask a question. Does anyone know the rule, the sorry rule? If you say, I'm sorry before you ask a question, what has to happen if someone does that? Who knows? $25. Yeah, man, you got to donate to uh, 10 push ups or you have to donate $10 to Islamic relief, man. Because there's no reason that you should have to tell me you're sorry to ask a question about Allah. That is a disaster if we've created a climate where people feel they have to say they're sorry. So this is your first, I think, or second or third time. So we're gonna give you a little break. We'll take a food stamp and some government cheese instead <laughs> for iftar. But all of us, some of us have actually done that. But we forgive you this time. We forgive you, inshallah. So the Sheikh, he says, Here we go. The first thing we're going to start doing on the regular is saying, La ilaha illallah. And he says, Rahimahullah, say this a lot and you will ascend to great heights. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise you. How important is La ilaha illallah? It's so important that even Allah says it. Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illallah. Allah says that He even bears witness La ilaha illallah. Imam al Ghazali says if you want to know how important La ilaha illallah is, imagine how many people went to Jannah just by saying it. 
And how many people went to hellfire? Who subhanahu wa ta'ala, who uh, um, denied it? Subhanallah, subhanallah. So the sheikh, he says something here that I think is really important. But before you get into it, let's talk about what is a tasawwuf, because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, controversy around things that don't need to be controversial. And the sheikh, he does something really cool, man. He defines it in two ways, and I appreciate this. And this shows you the nuance and the, um, like his erudition. He says, in order to divide, divide to sawaf, I'm going to divide it into two ways. One is a theoretical way, like you can think about it in the academy, right? And the second is an amali way, which is to sawaf, to skir, to nas, purification of the heart, development of the soul, and the inner character from the perspective of practice. And as you're going to see in a minute, the definition, which is the practical definition, is one that just does not put up with no mess. It doesn't, it doesn't allow for any, well, you know, semantics. No, 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 no. It's boom. Every time I read it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have a lot of work to do on myself. <laughs> you know, like, it just hits you, right? So first he gives the kind of academic definition because we know, you know, academics, no offense, they get a little, little sensitive if you don't, you don't follow certain protocol. So he says, And this is a very important word he uses. He says that tasawwuf is a knowledge of the usul. The word usul in scholarly nomenclature means something that came from Quran and Sunnah. So immediately when someone uses the word usul, this means that this thing is not an innovation in religion. And this kind of undermines everything that we see because of course you can call anything a, a name but it doesn't necessarily mean that it represents that thing so if we see people in the name of the soul of doing things which are untethered if we see people in the name of religiosity doing things which are untethered from the foundations we know this is wrong so here he centers it he says ilmun bi usul that tasawwuf is knowledge of the usul, the foundations, the Quran and Sunnah. Yu'rafu bihi sadahul qalbi, which is used to understand how you can purify and cleanse and sanitize, actually, is a better translation of this word, your heart and your soul. How do we how do we sanitize it? And I love the word salah because you know, like the name Salahuddin Ayubi, of course, the word islah is the idea of taking something that was corrupt and making it clean. Taking something that had shortcomings and making it whole. This is called Islah. So the science that we're going to be covering over the next few Tuesdays as we finish this part of the poem is how do I work on that heart? How do I get into that soul? So he says, the knowledge يُعْرَفُ بِهِ هُوَ عِلْمٌ بِأُصُولٍ The knowledge of Sacred text, that talks about how to purify and work on the heart, as well as al fikr, attitudes and ideas. Wasa'ir al hawas and my body, my limbs. So, in other words, this is a science which is related to bringing my body, my heart, and my mind into the reality of you alone we worship. Imam Ibn Qayyim, Allah yirhamu, he said that has four stations. The first is the cognitive one. Oh, this is, I believe this, I, I, I understand this logically. The second is the, the heart that affirms it and accepts it as faith. The third is how I talk. And the fourth is how I employ my limbs. How do I use the body Allah has given me? So the sheikh is saying that this is what this science is rooted. Are there evidences for this? Of course, in the Quran and Sunnah, Allah says, indeed, successful is a person who purifies his or her heart. Uh, Allah says, right? That the, 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 the heart, uh, the, 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 the,
It's not the eyes that are blind. In Sulta Abbasa, the blind man can see. The aristocracy can't see. The blind man is aware, but they can't see because he sees with his heart. They see with their eyes. So he sees at a very different level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the people of Mecca looking at the Prophet Muhammad. It says, wa tarahum you see them looking at you, but they don't see you. They don't perceive who you really are. When they see you, one of my teachers used to say, when the people of Mecca, who were the enemies of the Prophet, looked at the Prophet with their eyes, they saw Muhammad ibn Abdillah. But when Sayyidina Bilal and Sayyidina Sumayya looked at the Prophet with their hearts, they saw Muhammad Rasulullah. So there's the difference. So the sheikh is saying, how, how do we work on that? And we know that the prophet said that in the body, there's a piece of flesh. If it's sound, the whole body's sound. If it's corrupt, the whole body's corrupt. It's the heart. So the first thing that we can jump on, alhamdulillah, and start to put into practice is la ilaha illallah. It's to say la ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah. And then he says, bil adabi. So defining a tasawwuf, the sheikh, he says, huwa ilmun bi usurin, huwa ilmun bi usurin yu'rafu bihi salahu al-qalbi wa sa'ir al-hawas. This is the academic definition. Tasawwuf is the knowledge of the texts from Quran and Sunnah that teach us about purifying our heart, our attitudes, and our senses and our limbs. Now comes the hard one, the practical definition. Because, you know, when someone gives an academic definition, I always say, that, well, I'm not an academic. I'm good. Shoot. That does not apply to me. I'm okay. But the practical definition, <laughs> he says, well, Again, this is another academic definition. Sorry. He says, that the soul is to look after how you use your senses and your limbs and to shepherd your soul. Mura'at, like the shepherd with sheep, I'm looking after my heart. Now here comes the, uh, the practical definition. It's very nice, but it does demand responsibility. He says, There are three parts to this definition, and they are very powerful. The first, he says, is that when it comes to obeying the commands of Allah, you go the extra mile. So when it comes to doing good, I take extra steps, man. And when it comes to avoiding the forbidden, like I distance myself as far as I can, man, I get away from that joint. So I go the extra mile in avoiding the evil. Then he says, And then I restrict myself exclusively to necessities when it comes to the permissible. That's the hard one. <laughs> Because everybody like hot Cheetos, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's a tough one right there. Iqtisar ala dururiyat min al-mubahat. And what he's talking about, if you think about this now, is minimalism. To live a minimalistic life. Not to get caught up in the cult of consumption. So the sheikh, he says that tasawwuf in a practical, everyday form is rooted in three ideas. Number one, if people can also on the, on the Instagram type this in the chat box, super appreciated. Number one is to go the extra mile in obeying the commands of Allah. Number two, to be extra cautious and go the extra mile in avoiding evil, the haram. So what he's talking about here are triggers. What are the triggers I can establish in my life that help me obey? What are the triggers that are in my life that cause me to disobey? I need to deal with that. More or less is what he's saying. And then finally, he said, 
والاقتصار على ضروريات من المنهيات او من المباحات that I struggle, I don't have to, but I struggle to align my life, my life in a way that is very minimalistic. And even from the permissible, I restrict myself to the necessities. Of course, the Sheikh is a first round draft pick. <laughs> the Sheikh is a special type of guy. This is a battle and he's by no means saying like this happens once and it's all good. He's saying this is that process of purification of the heart, right? If you think about it, if you wanna climb a mountain, you certainly need provisions, but if you take too many provisions, you're not gonna be able to go up. So if I have too many provisions in this dunya that are not really intrinsic to, to my life and who I am, that may keep me and slow me down in my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, the goal of this is Salah al Qalbi wa Sa'ir al Hawasi wal Afkari fi dunya. Is that a person begins to work on and purify his or her heart, his or her perceptions, and his or her ideas and attitudes in this life. And that, that will lead to a greater sense of success and felicity in the hereafter. Alhamdulillah. So the first quality, Alhamdulillah, that he says, that say la ilaha illallah abundantly and you will achieve a great great station in the hereafter so start in now starting tomorrow you know it's very easy just when we can conveniently say la ilaha illallah but he says something very important here that i need to address and he says bil adab the word adab means etiquette we know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, أَقْرَبُكُمْ إِلَيَّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَحْسَنُكُمْ خُلُقًا Right? The closest of you to me in the hereafter are those who have great character. What he means by character here is three things. And this applies to every act of worship. This is very important. First of all, the etiquette before the act. So like you Steph Curry shooting some threes, you know what I mean? Stretching out, getting ready, right? So that's what's called al-qabaliya. So before the act, I get in the zone. I reduce the triggers that impact my ability to truly benefit from the act. I amplify the triggers that may actually help me further increase the work of ibadah. This is called al-qabaliyah, before. The second type of adab is called al-musahaba, from sahabi, you know, sahabi like a companion of the Prophet So this means the etiquette during the act. So how do I carry myself while the act is going on? And then the third etiquette is al-ba'diyah, after. How, how does the act impact me after I'm done with it. So we could think about uh, prayer, right? Before prayer, you know, I need to make wudu. I need to make sure I'm praying in the right direction, of course. But then also like, it's probably not a good idea to start praying if you just got into an argument with your spouse or with your kids or with a sibling or you were online and it was like super emotional and you wanna just jump into salah, you may need to give yourself a little time to get into the zone. This is what he means by al qabaliya So before, how am I carrying myself? If I'm up all on my phone, if I'm in Clubhouse or, you know, TikTok, if I'm going like Clubhouse, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, I'm slowly draining my capacity to give anything attention. And then suddenly I'm just going to jump into Salah. So taking a step back, some of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they actually changed colors. I'm teaching at Swiss this, uh, this month, a workshop on, on prayer, prayer with purpose. We talk about this right? How, how to slowly develop prayer with purpose. Because sometimes it becomes a ritual. We all, we all been there. We're all human beings, right? The second is the etiquette during the act. So during salah, like I don't, I don't need to be like giving like Taya a phone call. Hey, what's going on? How you doing? Oh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm right here on Fletcher. Just give me a minute. Uh, what? Okay, yeah, just a second. Allah Akbar. Right? Obviously, like, you're not going to be like doing that during the act. So, for example, in, in fasting, whoever doesn't leave bad speech and bad actions, Prophet warns us, look, during your fast, you still got to, don't think just because you're not eating and drinking, it's all great. But there's certain things you got to adhere to to maximize the benefit. So that's called musahaba, during. al badia after prayer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar, that prayer keeps away from evil. So the measurement of my salah is how it has protected me from falling into evil after it's over with. Subhanallah. So the sheikh now, he says something, that for the remembrance of Allah, for dhikr, there are these three components, before, during, and after. So the first quality of the, the sa'ir to Allah, the one traveling to Allah, is kathra to dhikr, is remembering Allah. Think about it in the Quran, man. Even on the battlefield, Allah says, إِذَا لَقِيْتُمْ فِئَةً فَثْبُتُوا وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ If you meet your enemies on a battlefield, stay firm and remember Allah. Even on a battlefield. At the end of Surah Al-Jumu'ah, after we finish our prayer, right? We're encouraged. وَبْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ As we go back to work, Allah says, remember Allah. So at, at, at our work, of course, you're not going to go up there and start freaking people out and yelling stuff. But it means, of course, like privately in, in your way, in your space, you're remembering Allah. So whether it was the battlefield, whether it was at work, the Quran is saying, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرُكُمْ Remember me, I remember you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, nobody remembers me in a gathering except that I remember them in a gathering. And nobody remembers me alone except I remember them secretly. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that seven people will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when no one will be under his shade except those seven. One of them is the person, Zakarallahu Khariyan, who remembers Allah alone and weeps. Imagine the drop from your eye could put out the hellfire. As the Prophet said that the, this face will never be touched by those drops that touch it out of reverence and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the shaykh, he says, The shaykh, he says that the different types of remembrance, the etiquettes when we engage in any act of worship are before, during, and after. You want to remember this, before, during, after. Before hajj, during hajj, after Hajj, Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik, someone asked him, how do I know if my Umrah is accepted? He said that you don't go back to the evil you did before it. So the Sheikh, he says, here are the etiquettes that we should think about before we sit down for dhikr. He says, number one is purification that you should try to be in a state of ritual purity, if possible. If possible, if you can, it's okay. And that the area around you should be pure. Number two, and this I found this actually really, really remarkable. And yet to wajjahu Allahi ta'ala bi raghbah. That when you engage in dhikr, when you enter into that space, you should turn to Allah with complete hope. Right? You, you, should, you should engage in the remembrance of Allah. You should enter this into a place of hope, subhanAllah. Now we go to institutions or communities. It's very difficult to enter with a sense of hope because of the climate that's set there. Or maybe sometimes we're so intimidated that the hope is taken from our heart. But here the Sheikh he says, that when you start to make dhikr, you should do so with tremendous hope. Why? 
because who inspired you to remember him? Like if you go into a state of dhikr or dua, you have to be careful of shaitan and insecurities that will tell you you're a bad person. But if you're a bad person, you wouldn't be invited to that party. If you were a bad person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have put in your heart to turn back to him. So the mere fact that you're thinking about feeling guilty or the mere fact that you're thinking about taking a step to Allah is one of the greatest signs that Allah loves you and has guided you and touched your heart. And he said, for that reason, when you walk into that moment, you should be submerged with hope. Because you're at a place where no one goes. How many people live an entire life and never remember Allah? So then who is it that turned it on for you? Who is it that put that in your heart? So he said, that should lead you to feel like, man, Allah has my back, man. You know, like I, I may be overcome by my own insecurities, but Allah brought me here. And now we understand why the Prophet said so many beautiful things about remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's the sign of this deep relationship between creator and created, between the worshipped and the worshipper. He says, And also before we go into this moments of dhikr, we should make some istighfar, we should repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we go like on a clean slate. You know what I mean? Our slate is clean. And to send salawat upon the Prophet because salawat is miftah, right? Sending salawat upon the Prophet is going to open so many doors, more than 81 virtues, sending salawat upon the Prophet and if possible, face the Qibla. Of course, when you're on a train at work, whatever, you know, you can't face the Qibla. It's all gravy. Sayyidina Yunus in the belly of a wish, fish, he couldn't uh, face the Qibla. But here he's talking about the deliberate moments of dhikr where we sit and we remember Allah. You know, subhanAllah, that according to the Quran and Hadith, wherever you have set, to remember Allah will be your friend on the day of judgment and witness for you. That Sharifa, that Ahsan, that Nora, that Lamis, that Marlene, they sat here and remembered you because the whole creation has no choice but to worship Allah. So they will bear witness that we aligned with that choice when we used them to worship him. That's why some sinners, may Allah protect us, they will deny sin, that they committed sin. And Allah says in Surah Al-Fusilat, أَنْتَقَنَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي أَنْتَقَ كُلَّ شيء. The skin of a person will say, Allah made me talk. Who causes all things to talk. Now I have to be a witness against you. Because you didn't use me in the right way. May Allah give us afiyah. But also, according to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, what's done good in these places will also be a witness, alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. So imagine like if you sat on the beach and you were just like, la ilaha illallah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Every grain of sand will be a witness for you, subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. Then he says, when yastahdir, you know, and that you should make sure, of course, as you go into this, that you're ready to be present. So those are the etiquettes of dhikr before. Now he's going to talk about the etiquettes during our remembering Allah. And this also applies to dua. He says, the first is that you should bring the meaning of what you're saying as best you can into your mind. Make it hadr, make it at the forefront. And of course, you can say it in any language, right? Whatever is going to impact you. And if you know Arabic, you can look at the translation also if that's going to help. But istihdar al-ma'na. 
istihdar al ma'na you know that you bring the meaning present into your life especially at that moment while you're remembering allah number 2 that you insert your entire being into the moment man as best you can and we know in surah qaf allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions this inna fi dhalika la dhikra li man kana lahu qalbun aw alqa as-sam'a wa huwa shahid that this quran is a reminder for the one who has a heart a heart the heart qalb hadir the heart that's present aw alqa as-sam'a and this is rhetoric in arabic is like or, and they th- through their hearing ulqi sam'i like i throw my hearing into something right it's meaning i'm listening attentively wa huwa shahid and this actually has two meanings which are really interesting the first is i am shahid on what i'm saying i am a witness to what's being said la ilaha illallah la ilaha illallah la ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah. And I'm witnessing this. It could also mean that I am so focused on the moment that later on, if you caught a witness to that moment, I was such, I was so focused that I, I could stand in the docket and be a witness against myself or for myself. Like I saw, I was so attentive in the moment that I'm now eligible to be a witness to the moment, meaning that's how much I was in it. very powerful then he says and this is kind of the opposite of what we hear right that the person remembers Allah with confidence and strength right not arrogance but like la ilaha illallah alhamdulillah right now no no mashallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought the person into this moment. Then he says, وَأَنْ يَكُونَ ذِكْرُهُ رَغْبَةً فِي مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ وَمَحَبَّتِهِ وَإِمْتِثَالًا لِأَمْرِهِ That's your remembrance of Allah. Rest on your hope in Him, seeking His pleasure, His love, and reigniting your commitment to obey him he said like that's it like that's what you want to be there for right increasing the capacity of hope seeking the pleasure of allah creating a relationship of mahabba and mahabba in english is hard to translate hope is love mahabba is a whole nother ball game mahabba is like intense insane love la li riya'in wa la li sam'a you're not doing this so people can know oh wow this guy's so amazing he's like such a righteous person look at them making dhikr or develop a name for yourself this is for allah Then he says the next etiquette wa an yanfiya al aqwana min qalbi that the person should erase the impact of the world from his or her heart before they jump into this situation of course it's not completely possible we're not perfect but we should try to peel away any any of the images of the dunya in our mind and in our heart He says something powerful لِأَنَّ مُلَاحَظَةُ شَيْءٍ مِنْهَا قَاطِعٌ عَنِ اللَّهِ لِأَنَّ مُلَاحَظَةِ شَيْءٍ مِنْهَا قَاطِعٌ عَنِ اللَّهِ Because every moment that I start to think about something else is cutting me off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance. Every moment like I allow something else to come into my heart and start to occupy it هَذَا قَاطِعٌ عَنِ اللَّهِ So before I jump in let me You know, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. I'm, it's acceptable, by the way, when making dhikr or dua, if I'm thinking about my kids, thinking about my wife, thinking about my job, thinking about, and I'm making dua, or I'm making dhikr with that, like, oh, Allah, help me through this, or, oh, Allah, khafif li hadha. 
هذا الـ هذا الضرر or my exams that's 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 not what he's talking about here what he's talking about is yo man did I did I put that money aside from my 401k or not oh oh I mean right that's that's what he's talking about right? he's not talking about making dua or being concerned or or in love with 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or something in that way what he's talking about is to be careful of thinking about things just for no reason. But if it's something that I love, something I care about, and I have this relationship with Allah, of course, I love Allah. So when I think about Allah, oh Allah, you're the only one who can help me. That's okay. What he means here is to be like, you know, caught up. Then he says, If you can sit like when you make tashahud, because it's a, a sitting of obodiyah, but you don't have to if you can't. Uh, the next he said is to like not be looking around, you know, to try to stay focused. Because when you look around, it may take, it may distract you, you know, from what you're supposed to be uh, looking at. And that you end by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last one will stop here because it's almost time for iftar. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, almost that time. Is the etiquettes after. The etiquettes after. And that's very simple. There are four things that should come out of truly being engaged in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first is a root renewed commitment to Allah. A renewed commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to following the Prophet. Second, a, rude, a renewed commitment to the good things in my life, what really matters, like my family. Like what's what's the priority? I should come out with a sense of priorities. Third, I should be able to recognize some evil that I'm engaged in and start to distance myself from it. Fourth, I should think about certain good things that I have neglected and begin to work on it. To capture it very simply is that the etiquette ba'diyah is to leave evil and increase in good. That's the ultimate impact of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next week, inshallah, we're going to talk about the seven type of nafs. Know that there are different type of nafs mentioned in the Quran and how we can think about where we are in relationship to those seven nafs. And then we're going to talk about the second quality, and that is the quality of fear and hope. So the first quality is related to a practice we can do, is remembrance. Next week is going to be what? An attitude. My respect for the sacred. We live in an era now where the sacred has been completely domesticated. It's the blunt of jokes. Inshallah, it's not translated as I know, but I will share a translation here. And then for people on Instagram, a lot of people, mashallah, I'll try to get to them as well. Before we close out, let's make some dua before iftar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yataqabal uh, minna, inshallah, hadha al-yawm, yawm, yawm azim. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this day for us. And if there's any dua requests, feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll read them as well as here. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this day from us and to make it a springboard for better days in the future. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us be brave enough to overcome our evil and to replace it with good. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the barakah of this fast to heal us of any of our ailments that we may have, whether physical, psychological, or emotional. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a greater capacity to love others and to forgive others and to be in the service of others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless American Muslims and Muslims all over the globe. We know that our brothers and sisters in Palestine continue to suffer under indescribable, unimaginable difficulties. Our brothers and sisters in Western, Eastern Ethiopia, nobody's really talking about, unfortunately, 
uh, continue to suffer under incredible challenges. We see our Yemeni brothers and sisters in America engaged in a food, on a hunger strike because of what's happening in Yemen. People have to die so other people can live. That's the only way people will listen. Uh, we pray for our brothers and sisters across the globe, in Africa, in Yemen, in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, our brothers and sisters in Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, you know, can go through all of them, man. Bosnia, Albania, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yansur al-Islam wa al-Muslimin. Niyakawitna inshallah bihad al-deen. Ask Allah, most importantly, we come on this first day, we present all of our sins in front of him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to obliterate our sins with his rahmah. Take us to bring us close to him and to forgive us, insha'Allah. We pray for all of our new convert brothers and sisters who Ramadan certainly can be very challenging for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you, insha'Allah. We pray for brothers and sisters who may be having troubles in their marriage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the month of Ramadan to bring love and mercy between you, inshallah. We have a number of young men and women who are worried about getting married, especially with COVID-19 really impacted. Their ability creates a lot of stress. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them, inshallah, with salihin, awliya, and muqarrabi, inshallah. We pray for the family of George Floyd who continues to have to watch people try to make sense of a public execution. We see again in Minnesota, Minneapolis, the public execution of a person, a human being, in Chicago of a 13-year-old child. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us on the side of Haq and not on the side of Fir'aun. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us on the side of justice and truth. And we see also what's happening in our brothers and sisters texting now from India, tremendous challenges in Kashmir, in Morocco, India, inshallah, in, in Kashmir, we make dua. Remember our brothers and sisters in Mali, in Gambia, in Senegal, in Chad, alhamdulillah, in the Congo. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite the Muslimin ala khair. And that Allah makes this month, inshallah, a month of transformation for each and every one of us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for every discomfort we feel in Ramadan, he gives us something better in the Jannah, inshallah. And we ask Allah as though we have stayed away from food and drink, we've become thirsty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to break our fast at the fountain of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa we pray for our pregnant brothers, our pregnant sisters and their husbands, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ease this pregnancy for them. We, we pray, for, I got a fasting brain, what do you expect? Man, you make dua, guys. Nobody wants to type dua, so I got to do it. Uh, we pray for our pregnant sisters and their husbands. I had a child during Ramadan two years ago, so I know it's difficult. We pray for our brothers and sisters who have eating disorders. It's a very difficult time for them, and we want them to know we love them and care for them. We pray for our brothers and sisters who have the chemical and substance abuses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them the strength to make it through this month, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our Uyghur brothers and sisters in East Turkmenistan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them thabat and help us to help them, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakum wa khairan. I think it's now time for iftar. I don't know what time in New York it is. I'm in D.C. at the moment. But here in D.C., I think it's the next few minutes. Uh, and you guys are usually in front of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us and bless all of you. Jazakum Allahu khairan wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Ramadan Mubarak to each and every one of you. And next week we'll continue. And this Thursday we have a very important program. And tomorrow night, all nights here at the IC, there's amazing things happening, man. Just it's incredible. So make sure you come through and check them out. Jazakum Allahu khairan. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barakatuh. Sayyidina Muhammad wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullah.